We have three panelists with us today. Um, Alan Edel, who, who is, uh, has a great deal more experience of, of uh, management of patients with uh, radiotherapy than I do. Um, Tony Crispino, who is the SWOG uh, patient representative on the SWOG GU panel. And Jim Wickstrom, who I, 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 for some, I, there's some rumor that you may have treated him. So, um, yeah, I think I, think I know Jim. <laughs> um, so maybe, Alan, are you there? Yes. Perhaps you would I like to, to see if you have some que- a couple of questions uh, for Dr. Cianti. Sure. Uh, one question I have is about that Ushida study you mentioned. Uh, they reported five-year biochemical recurrence-free survival of 48% for the Sonoblade 200 model, and then over time it came up to 82% for the Sonoblade 500 TM model. And I was wondering, is, is that due to technological advances? And if so, what what were they? Because that's a, an astounding improvement. Or is, is it a, a practitioner expertise just coming along the, the learning curve? And uh, what what advances, what further advances would you like to see in the technology in the future? That's a, that's an excellent excellent question. Okay, um, so to answer your question, I, I think it's there's been major technological advances. There's no way we can discount the fact that the practitioner got better. So there's a bit of both going on there, but. The major advances, the Sonoblate 200 was a very primitive device that can only treat the prostate, in, and I don't want to get too technical here, but it treated in a 60-degree sec- sector window, which means that you had, to, you, know, you had to treat the standard prostate instead of three zones in at least six, if not eight zones. Now, what that did is it left a lot of possibilities for uh, missing tissue. If you didn't have complete overlap, there was tissue that wasn't treated. Um, we know that once we start to deliver energy to the prostate, the prostate's going to swell. It's going to change size. So when we design a HIFU treatment, we're capturing a series of, of ultrasound images, and then we're, we're, we're designing a treatment to, 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 to cover a series of captured images. Now, the minute you turn the machine on and start to treat somebody, the prostate changes size and shape. So it's a very dynamic process, but you're using a treatment plan that you designed at some point earlier in the procedure. And so if the prostate is changing size and shape, what was happening in those early days is the energy was going to a target that was old. In other words, the target changed and you didn't recognize it. So one of the first major advances made technically with the Sonoblate was that it had what's called a restacking feature. It had the ability to, after five to seven minutes of treatment or so, or or at numerous intervals, to take a brand new series of images and realign the treatment with the new images and then adjust the treatment to the changing target. Adjust the treatment to the changing target. Very important because now you can continue to conform the energy to the changing target. That was one of the major advances as you went from a, the Sonoblate 200 to the Sonoblate 500. Um, a second and very important change was the ability to incorporate what's called tissue change monitoring, or TCM. That's a TCM version. So as ultrasound energy goes from the transducer up into the prostate, there is some absorption and attenuation of energy on the way to the focal zone or to the target. Okay. And so as that occurs, there is really was no way to assure there is the proper deposition or absorption of energy in the target zone as opposed to it being absorbed in the pre-target zone or in the area where, be, between the target and the, and the rectal wall. And so tissue change monitoring is a mechanism by which the software is able to measure the, the physical characteristics of the tissue and ultrasound before and after the treatment pulse and document the degree to which the characteristics changed. 
Okay. Now that has been documented in human in vivo in a study that was done uh, by Dr. Marburger, in which they were able to correlate actual temperature temperature changes in the focal zone with the measured TCM changes. So, from a practical standpoint, as one is doing the treatment with TCM, one delivers treatment to an area, and in real time, on the fly, as we treat, we're getting a direct readout from the software about whether each little volume of tissue we treat is getting the appropriate energy and whether it's changing. If it doesn't, we can go back and on the fly retreat that zone. So when we leave the procedure room, we have a better assurance that the area that's been targeted has absorbed has absorbed enough energy to cause a treatment change. That's been very important. One of the other changes that happen physically in the device is the size of the treatment lesion also increased between the sonoblate 2 and 200 and 400. And now we had available, for example, the ability to make a 12 by 12 by 3 lesion. And what that did technically, it allowed us to treat little larger prostates with more overlap between the zones. So those three, tech, those three uh, advances, you know, going to a, a stacking mode, going to larger lesions, going to tissue change monitoring were major technical advances. Now, those were in place uh, even several years ago because Yoshida's reported on outcomes using TCM. And and TCM was introduced, and he first began to use it somewhere around uh, 2011 or so, 2010, 2011. As for the future, I think... Anyone who knows some of the work I do, I'm a major advocate of using MRI to define the disease as well as to help design treatment. So one of the major advances we're seeing now is the integration of MRI fusion into the treatment platform. So in other words, we can use MRI to tell us several things. We can help us to understand prostate anatomy better. We can help us to understand the location of the neurovascular bundles, and we can help us to identify, you know, the locations of the most significant tumor location in the prostate. That information then can be superimposed onto the ultrasound images to help in treatment planning, and I think that's a major advance. Um, so uh, that that is the future for that really exists now because that technology has been integrated into both manufacturers' platforms. The Sonoblate platform has it and will have it in the United States. And the uh, EDAP platform, they call their platform the Focused One that has MRI integration, is available in Europe. And it's my understanding that EDAP will plan to make that available soon in the United States as well. Okay, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for um questions from, from the patients that are on the line uh, other than the panel. So, um, Tony, do you have w- one question for Dr. Cianti? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Cianti, for a very comprehensive explanation. It's uh, very helpful. The uh, uh, question I come on over, being somebody who works from the uh, clinical trial background, it's informed consent forms. If we go ahead and address them in clinical trial setting, I hear your explanation that while the uh, uh, procedure is approved in the U.S., there's only so much claim about what you can say you're doing. How is this addressed directly with the, with the uh, patient, and how do you explain to them that while you can't say cancer-specific, uh, perhaps what you can say at this particular point has been not but maybe your, your input on exactly what you can tell that patient is uh, very helpful. Well, no, I think that's a great point, uh, and that's that's why I tried to make that point earlier and try to you know work through what the FDA uh, you know um, uh, you know um, uh, language was. I think it's very important. Um, you know, at this point, making uh, you know having a conversation with a patient, and 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 again, it's all about uh, being uh, full disclosure here. To say that we have proof that we can cure your prostate cancer. Uh, that 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 can't be a that's not substantiated. Okay, uh, I talk I'm, as an ablation specialist. I talk about ablating disease, ablating ablating regions of abnormal tissue, ablating tumor. That's that's short of that's short of claiming cures. So I, I think patients have to understand 
what ablative therapies can do and what they can't do. Okay, so if we can if we can take a targeted area and turn it biopsy negative. Does that prove that, that there won't be a recurrence? No. Does that prove that there can't be distant recurrence? No. And I think those kind of conversations have to be had. So I, I, so I think it really comes down to the conversation. Now, what will we see in the United States? We're going to see all kinds of things said to patients. Uh, you, you know, there's no question about that. Uh, you know, that subtle distinction, and maybe for us, it's the, for those of us on the, on the call, it's not terribly subtle. But for a lot of physicians, they won't get that distinction between ablation and, and, and true cancer treatment. So uh, I think you will see a lot of what you're referring to and what you're probably concerned about. I think you'll see some of that going on in the U.S. I think those of us that are in a position of uh, you know, medical directorship and leadership are very clear about the language we use and what we tell patients. And Jim, do you have a question for Dr. Siondi? Well, good question. Uh, I, he's actually answered my questions very well. Um, I would just like to say that I kind of backdoored prostate cancer by having uh, a physician stand over me and tell me he's got an appointment on Friday if I wanted my surgery, which was a little challenging emotionally. And I did my due diligence by interviewing um, dozens of patients. And that's where I learned everything. And, boy, you hear a whole lot of the patient groups and their complaints and their feelings um, that are very personal because losing, for a man to lose his ability to urinate, control the urination or impotence is just challenging. And as Dr. Siante pointed out, you've got to do one-on-one -on -one work with people. And so many physicians are not trained to do this. They move on to the next patient, as we all know. And since the urology community is in conflict with itself in so many ways, uh, having this less invasive treatment of HIFU available is so powerful, so that's all I wanted to say. So, Dr. Siondi, I have one last question for you before we, uh, I give this back to Priya for her to, to bring in the, the other people on the line. Um, that, that relates to the use of HIFU in uh, focal therapy. Uh, I assume you have some experience of at least trying this. Um, and I'm curious, uh, you know, whether you think that this is a, a really serious opportunity um, to expand the potential for focal therapy. Uh, the, the answer is yes, and I'll elaborate just for a moment. Again, I don't want to steal everybody's time here. Um, I, I'm very much... Um, you, you've had Dr. you've had Professor Emberton on here as a guest on this uh, on this forum, and, and and I'm one of his disciples, you might say. Okay, uh, I've worked with Mark on met numerous uh, numerous committees. We've been on, on faculty for on a lot of uh, courses that we've we've taught together, and and I believe in properly selected patients, and this is the key uh, that focal therapy is a real opportunity. Now, the challenge of focal therapy is diagnostics. If one tries to select patients for focal therapy based on a systematic 10 or 12 core ultrasound guided biopsy, it will fail because that diagnostic technique is not capable of selecting out patients who truly have focal disease. There's no question that there are patients with an index lesion and clinically insignificant disease or absent disease elsewhere in the project, but you've got to work hard to find those with advanced diagnostics. And in, in, in much like the, uh, the uh, Hash Ahmed and Mark Emberton, uh, in our center, we really advocate uh, 3T MRI, systematic and fusion biopsy, and, and really a careful, careful selection of men who are candidates for focal. But yes, in those patients, there's no question that on the side effects side, there's a marked decrease in side effects. What we don't know long term is how many of those patients will develop disease in the preserved part of the prostate, and that's the question. I'm very confident in the ability to destroy an index lesion. We know that we can do that uh, in excess of 90% of the time by, by biopsy documentation. But what we don't know is the preserved tissue. What chance does that preserved tissue have of developing significant prostate cancer over five years, 10 years, 15 years. That question's unanswered. That is the, that's the controversy about focal therapy. Uh, so, and I think you've, you've we certainly have heard that discussion, I think, on this, in this, uh, in this uh, debate many times. But uh, I think it's an opportunity, if done uh, with uh, careful diagnostics.